Hello everyone, this is Dan with the Spiritual Underground Podcast coming to you from the wood shop at DTM Enterprises, my little wood shop in the backyard. Um, Come to you on a rainy Sunday morning, uh, get the commercials out of the way, uh, we'll start with that one, DTMWW.net is my little handyman woodworking business here in the Louisville metropolitan area, you need anything up at that alley, uh, check me out there, DTMWW.net, there's also a contact me page there. SpiritualUnderground.org supports this podcast there. You can also find a contact me page and you can find show notes. You can find uh, pictures of the guests when they uh, are okay with that. As we say here, the uh, Spiritual Underground podcast protects the anonymity of others at the level they wish it to be protected. So if somebody doesn't want their picture on there, we don't do it. Um, Darren Frank's music wraps around this podcast and uh, he's still in a rehab joint, uh, physical therapy, not a not a substance abuse rehab joint, but a physical therapy kind of deal coming off of some uh, health issues. And we visit him on Christmas Eve is a, a really good look, took a meeting to him and he's in really good spirits. He's uh, to be going through what he's going through and watch uh, him stay. His spirits remain high no matter what happens to him. And I've heard us said a couple times lately that uh, this program promised me doesn't promise me that it will be OK. But it promised me that I can be okay through whatever it is. And Darren is a shining example of that happening in a guy's life that works this program today. If you haven't been listening to the Spiritual Underground Podcast, if this is the first time, we are primarily a 12-step recovery-based podcast. Although I do um, explore other areas of recovery uh, and, and I broaden that definition pretty wide uh, because I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a limit to it. Um, And so if you have something that doesn't necessarily fit here, I'd love to hear about it. We've had divorce recovery people on here. We've had uh, people who have found their true selves through the practice of yoga. Uh, So I like to explore that stuff, too. We do a little nicotine cessation on this also because I think when we continue to improve the quality of our lives, that's one area many of us that come in with the substance issues. uh, That's a substance that gets a little overlooked. Uh, I'm happily at 803 days off of that substance today, and uh, and I do count every single day. And I might even tell you, I know this is a little bit of a stretch, but I may I, I <clears throat> I'll quit apologizing for what I'm going to say. Here's the way I feel: I am more proud of my nicotine quit than I am of my dope and my booze because my ass was not on fire when I did that. And I'll tell you what is one of the hardest things I've ever done was putting that substance down. Uh, I was two years sober when I attacked it. And, uh, and, and, and I was sitting with a sponsee across the table talking to him about improving the quality of his life through these steps while I was spitting in a cup. And uh, it was like God hit me over the head. Uh, and it's like how hypocritical it was for me to be sitting here preaching this, doing that. And, and not that that's for everybody, but that was for me. And, uh, and, and I took on to quitting that, that substance. And, uh, and so if you're, if you're struggling with that, want some help with that, I have some experience to share with you. Um, what else we got? 12 Step Spiritual Recovery is a book by James Christopher Cohn. It is available on Amazon. Uh, it is the 12 Steps for Everyone. It is a deep dive into the work. Um, it is the tribal, it contains a lot of the tribal knowledge is not contained in the, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous book, uh, on, um, the whys and what's and the underneaths of some of this, this step work. And it's also, uh, packaged in a way to deliver it to anyone, uh, not only those who are current, 12-step fellowship uh, participants or qualifiers. So 12-step spiritual recovery. We've got meetings going on in Louisville. You can go to 12stepspiritualrecovery.com for meeting notes on that. There's also a Facebook page of the same name. So get all that stuff out of the way and get to why we're here today. Uh, I don't, you, you, you run around these rooms and you hear people talk and share and, uh, and and that's why we do it is so that we show up we share our lives so that other people can hear and we learn from one another uh, one of the things i've heard uh, that I, another saying that i like is that one of the, the opposite of addiction is connection uh, we do this thing in a community fashion and we uh that we word is very important to me uh, i could never get sober but we seem to be able to uh, so uh, you hear people talk and you hear them share and, uh, they strike you and, and, and it may, I like to say everybody's a teacher, right? Some people are teaching me what to do and some people are teaching me what not to do. Uh, but I've heard tomorrow, our guest today, 
a couple times early on. I don't really know her that well, although for the, in my entire sobriety, and I have about four years in bouncing off, I say bouncing off the halls and walls and, uh, and not getting sober. And then uh, another, well, coming up on five now of where I finally was able to read the words completely, absolutely, and thoroughly and start actually applying this stuff in my life in a way that, that, that made the change. Uh, so I, I remember seeing you in meetings and you had an impact on me because you shared in a strong way. Um, and uh, one of the things that I saw when I talked, when I, when I saw you, what I saw was somebody who like had a grasp on what they, who they were. Uh, that had a handle on on their uh, they had their voice and, and could share it in a way that didn't give a shit whether everybody anybody else liked what I heard what I had to say or not uh, this is what this is me and you shared your experience and I like that blunt straightforward nature that I saw see um, I don't remember exactly what happened I'll tell you exactly what happened I don't have enough female voices on this podcast plain and simple and there's a lot of strong recovery in our in the female community too i started out doing this with all my buddies right so that's why who i roped into coming at first and frankly i was a little shy about inviting uh females to come be on the podcast uh i put a i put a line out trying to get more in here uh, i want some more balance in the podcast some more uh gender balance and and so that was the first thing i started thinking who do i know who i've heard talk that impressed me and i and that i could send a note out to and say hey why don't you come be on the podcast and you were one of the first people to come into my mind so uh thank you for coming in today and uh really gonna appreciate what i've seen earlier that collateral I, I stopped short of it that collateral damage thing that i started on earlier the collateral benefit is is that when i sit here and talk to somebody and hear their story uh i get to know somebody better and, and that's what I, that's something i wrote that's something, one of my goals today is to get to know uh the people in my community better and, and i get a new friend by doing this too sometimes uh, the last three people have came i didn't meet them until they pulled up in the driveway i didn't even know what two of them looked like I knew what the one of them I had uh, uh, was through a mutual friend. I think I saw him on Facebook or something like that. But the two of them, I had no idea. I just had to assume that guy pulled up my driveway, was walking up to my door, was my guest today. Uh, and that's cool, too, because you get a new friend that you never knew and you get a story. And it also allows the podcast to branch out into directions mm-hmm. that um, that the, where it hasn't been yet. This is uh, January 4th will be the year from my first podcast that I uh sent out and we're we're bearing down on ten thousand downloads in that year and i'm pretty happy with that number and uh and i've gotten emails back from uh i've been contacted from california to new york to uh, all over this country of people who have caught the podcast and sent me an email and, and and said something about it and uh and as far away as uh africa yeah uh english speaking africa so that's pretty cool and uh and 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 reaching out be able to carry a message that far today with today's technology i believe uh you know can you imagine how hard it was in the beginning to try to carry the message and get around and and, you know how blessed we are today specifically how blessed we are in this region Mm -hmm. that if you want to go to a meeting there's absolutely no way that you can make an excuse to me that you can't make a meeting right uh somebody will take you and there's hundreds of them a week uh you, there's not every place is like that you, know, you don't have to go far to end up going be in some place where you you maybe get a meeting a week mm-hmm. so welcome to the studio thank you to my little wood shop uh doing okay today i am i'm a little sore from yoga yesterday but i'm doing okay yeah i said uh we'd had a uh a, a schedule we'd scheduled this earlier and uh something happened and we ended up having to cancel that day and uh then i <laughs> by providence or divine intervention or whatever kind of words you want to use around it i bumped into you yesterday in a yoga studio and uh just like when i uh, that bell goes off and says ding ding and then i also said oh chris i want to ask her too and see if mm-hmm. she'll she shied away from it really fast and, and that's okay too i would never want to like so if i ask you and you turn me down i usually don't i usually don't even try again right uh, i'm not looking to coerce people to be here <laughs> i like willing participants <laughs> right uh and i actually had a friend the other day i asked him a long time ago and he you know just kind of played with it you know yeah it sounds cool but he didn't follow up and i 
tapped him on the shoulder a couple more times, and then I let it go. And then just the other day, he said, hey, man, you still want me on your podcast? I, I sure do. Uh, so he's scheduled to come in here in a few weeks. So it's, it's cool. So what I like to always start out with before we get to going on the story is uh what your sobriety date is because that's really that uh, i will say that's the most important day of my life actually at this moment is the day that i that's that's when the tables turn for me so my sobriety date is december 23rd of 2010 so you just crossed over nine years i did yeah um two days before christmas i got sober two days before christmas nine years ago wow Mm -hmm. uh so what what made you uh what how I don't want to jump around. We'll get to it. So what I do like to do is uh, I didn't do not disturb my tape recorder and it dings. I do not disturb my phone, but that thing. I don't know if you can hear the ding in the podcast. I never listened. Um, what I like to do is go back because I believe that I had this malady way before I ever took my first drink. Mm-hmm. I believe that I had something going on that 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 uh, family system kind of something or you know there's a lot of other things. Uh, what I like to say is that something there was things in the it sounds biblical kind of talk, and I don't mean it to sound that way, but the world stepped on my spirit early on. Uh, I started ended up having issues with peers, um, trying to figure out how to navigate life. And when I found the substance, it was like the golden key when when I first found that. you know. So I was looking for that the whole time. Uh, like that first 12 years of sobriety I had until I was 12 years old, <laughs> uh, I was still trying to find some something to fulfill me. And, and I, I didn't know that then, but I can look back and see it now. So I like to start about like, where, are you from here? No, you're not. No, um, I was born in Canada, but um, I grew up mostly in Arizona. Yeah, I see you now and again. You go back there, don't you? Good. To, or I've seen you take some trips or something back in that. Um, I've been back to Arizona once since I got sober. And maybe um, I'm thinking of Las I Vegas. I go back to Vegas like twice a year, which is where. Um, my addiction really started and took off so it has a special place in my heart yeah so tell me a little about growing up Ooh. um all right so my father um was an alcoholic for sure for sure he uh actually made it in the rooms for a couple of years when i was like 21 i think but i didn't know this at the time i didn't find out until much much later um so he was an alcoholic like any good alcoholic you need a good enabler codependent which was my mother yep um so i am uh my name's tamar and i am a person in long-term recovery um and i say that because my recovery is not just from drugs and alcohol um my first and foremost addiction is codependency 100 mm. percent. yeah um, when i look back i come by them both honestly um but i grew up and spent most time with my mother so i come by my codependency really honestly um we moved around a lot when i was really really little um We would spend half of the year in Canada and half of the year in Arizona, which, as you can figure, is a really big culture shock. Um, But I I honestly don't remember a lot before five. Um, And I would assume there was something really traumatic that happened in there. Hmm. I can't prove it. It hasn't been revealed to me yet, but I would assume... Um, I do remember, like, the classic alcoholic stuff, like fighting, hitting, screaming... um, If it tells you anything about their relationship, they were married and divorced twice by the time I was five, right? Because normal people would not get married and divorced to the same person twice, but alcoholics, absolutely. Yeah. Um, The story goes that my mother finally, like, had had enough of his bull stuff and was like, no, you got to go. I don't remember any of that. What I do remember, like, my very first memory... I was five years old. Um, My dad took me to a family friend's house. He said, I love you, baby. I'll see you later. And he never came back. He um, moved about four states away. Um, And what I know today is that's that's alcoholism, right? Um, Normal people don't just like dip out on their kids and move five five states away. Um, But little Tamar didn't know that. Little five-year-old Tamar didn't know that. Um, and I wondered what was wrong with me. Like, why was I not good enough that you never came back? 
Um, and I blamed my mother because it had to be her fault that he left. And I blamed my father for leaving. Um, and that would have been like my first real resentment, even though I didn't know what a resentment was. But that profoundly um, impacted my entire life. My dad was like my best friend before that. Like he would take me to the bar and I would sit on the stool with him because it was like the 80s and yep, nobody cared. Right. Um, we would go to the dog track, to the races. We went to the rodeo. Like he was my best friend. Um, so after that, it was me and my mom, you know, um, and I can honestly say that she did the best that she could, but it wasn't enough. Like, um, I had everything materially that I could ever want. Her addiction was traveling. We traveled all over the world together. Um, by 16, I had been on 16 different cruises. Wow. I've been to Japan. I've been to Africa. Um, but all I ever really wanted was just be like a normal kid and have friends. Um, and so all the traveling plus spending half the year in Arizona and half the year in Canada, um, well, it didn't make me different. I was different. Like nobody that I knew. Nobody else was doing that. (laughs) Nobody else did that. Um, they spell things differently in the two different countries. So I would literally just get the hang of things, um, being spelled in America and I go to Canada and be wrong. So then I just get the hang of spelling things up there. I come back to America and it would be wrong. Um, was that a weather dependent move or was that? Yes. So my mother was a snowbird. Um, what I also need to say is like, she worked her ass off. She is a single mom and she worked hard. You would have to, if you're going to do all that traveling. Yeah. And, uh, so like I was alone a lot looking back at it and back then it was fine. But, um, I noticed the difference cause like my sponsor has a daughter And I was like, well, you could leave her alone for like an hour, right? Like, how old do they have to be to do that? And she's like, oh, I wouldn't do that. And I was like, well, well, I was alone alone from a really young age. Like, I can remember it. Um, And the other thing, my mother's other addiction was laying out in the sun. So um, no matter where we were, if it was sunny, she would be out at the pool from like 9 a.m. to 4 or 5. And that's what it was. Like every day. Um, so I had to entertain myself a lot. Um, and the only rule that she really had for me was, um, get good grades in school and you can do whatever you want. And I'm not bragging and I'm not boasting, but, um, school's always been really, really easy for me. I don't have to try, um, even college and stuff. Like I just get straight A's and I don't really try. It just comes to you. Mm-hmm. Um, a gift, hell of a gift. It is a gift. Um, it is a gift that I don't really have to struggle with it. Um, I probably got that from her and him. They were both pretty smart. Um, so a couple things that my mom instilled in me as a young child that has carried on. Um, we did not have strong moral compasses. Like she raised me that if it benefited the family, it doesn't matter. Just do it. So like how kids eat free um at the buffet under three i was three for a really long time (laughs) like um i have friends that knew us back then and they were like you're probably the biggest kid that i knew that was in a stroller (laughs) like um we lied to the IRS, like all kinds of stuff i learned from a very young age to keep my mouth shut um and just do what what supported the family um like those little The little boxes, the UNICEF boxes that used to take door to door, um, I would take them door to door and just keep the money. Like, it was fine. It was not a big deal. Um, And all that was supported and all that was benefited. And the other thing that she taught me very young was that we don't talk about what goes on at home. Mm. Whatever happens at home stays at home. If you have problems, we don't talk about them. You just sweep them under the rug. Um, And I would say that that's part of the codependency piece. Um, and I would also say that comes from some traumatic things that probably happened to her as well. Cause what we know is like intergenerational trauma, right. like she did the best that she could, um, coming from where she came from. But I remember her telling me stories of her growing up in some weird shit. And so she had her own demons that she was fighting. Um, 
Those cycles don't get broken. I mean, we can only we can only really hand to the next generation the tools that we were handed, really, unless you end up having something that changes your trajectory to what you are able to get some new tools. Uh, I don't know how to I don't know how to raise kids except for the, how my family system taught me to raise kids. I don't know how to do that. I know. And I also know, like, the culture was very different back then. Like, we didn't talk about child abuse. And we didn't talk about, like, mental health. And these things were not okay to talk about. So I do understand. We didn't talk about the drinking in my family. It was just kind of like, you know. No, uh, no, no. I mean, that's just so-and-so, you know. And it was just was not looked at as an issue. Yes. I 100% agree with that. Because I don't think... That my mother ever said my father was an alcoholic. Like, I know she knew. And she did say, like, he was drinking and smoking weed, and that's why she made him leave. Yeah, but he drank like, too much. And yeah, he, she know, never and... put out there, like, a label or, like, this is a problem. Yeah. Basically, it's just what it was. Um, so, around fourth grade, uh, we ended up staying in Arizona full-time year-round. Um because they started teaching French in Canada, and I could not, like, do a, a half year of French and a half year of Spanish. Like, I could not. I was not What capable. part of Canada? Like, an hour out of Toronto, Hamilton. Okay. Um, so, we ended up staying in Arizona full time. And um, I was, like, the really tall, awkward, nerdy kid that sat in the corner that you wanted to sit by and cheat off of. That's just who I was. Um Probably decently shy. Um, my social interaction skills were not 100% amazing. Like, I can make friends with anybody, but um, I don't really like people. And even, I think, as a small child, I really didn't like people. So um, People scared me. I didn't know what I was getting. I didn't know how to do you. I was afraid of being rejected. Me. I'm just talking about me. I'm not. Yeah. yeah I can, but I'm really what I can relate to is like not for me. I think a lot liking people kind of throwed me a little, but like what I was, I was scared of other people. I, I had a fear that, uh, of getting close to other people from the get go. Cause every time I did get to some close to somebody, uh, uh, and I'd tell them something private, mm-hmm. you know, like that wouldn't stay private right. or, you know, other, other ways where I learned where, you know, it just wasn't cool to trust people. I think for me, um, it was like the fear that if they ever saw or knew who I was, I wouldn't be good enough. Yeah. Because that's what it was really with my mother. Um, She was a diehard perfectionist. And like to other people, she might expound on my virtues. And like my daughter gets straight A's and my daughter does this. and my. But to me, it was, um, well, you could do better. Like it was never good enough. Hmm. Nothing was ever good enough. Um, and her and my father's relationship was really, really toxic. So like when he left, um, she would tell me things like, you know, your dad left cause he doesn't love you. Oh, wow. Um, you're not worth the $164 in child support that he's not willing to pay. Like just weird, strange. And like I said, that that's her her concept and the probably the way that she was brought up, but really detrimental things to a child's self-esteem and self-image mm-hmm. for sure. Um, so it was me and my mom and uh, we traveled and everything was the best that it could be, I suppose, as long as I did whatever she wanted me to do, um, which worked out probably until I was about a teenager, right? Because that's when you start getting your own ideas and your own concepts. And, of course, you got the know-it-all syndrome and um, you know everything. <coughs> and so a couple of different things happened around 13. Um, number one, I dated my first guy which was, like, amazing. We were going to get married and have kids. Like, his last name went with my first name. It was going to be beautiful. I didn't tell him any of this, of course. (laughs) This was your idea. (laughs) Well, I'm a planner, right? So I have beautiful plans and designs, but I forget to tell the other people involved. And that's like a repetitive cycle Hmm. in my whole story is I have these beautiful dreams and ambitions, but I don't tell the other people that I think should be involved. So, um, my first boy, it was great. It was like two months. Um, 
and that I was going to Canada that summer, so he broke up with me. Hmm. So, like, in hindsight, that makes sense, right? Like, I'm going to another country for a couple months, and we're, like, 13. Yeah. That's probably fine. Um, but I did not take it well. Um, I did proceed to cut my wrists. Oh. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would call it a full suicide attempt, but I would call it definitely like a, a cry for help hmm. or a cry for attention. Um, and so when my mother came home and discovered this, she, um, took some liquid bandages, which if you don't know what they are, they're awful things. They hurt really, really bad. And she sprayed liquid bandages on my wrist. She wrapped them with gauze and she sent me to swim practice that afternoon. Um, we did not talk about anything because that's, we don't do that in my household. Um, you just suck it up and you, the show must go on. Um, the other thing that happened when I was 13 was that I discovered alcohol. Um, and the first time I ever drank, um, I drank a couple bottles to myself. Um, I was on a cruise for New Year's. I blacked out, I fell down some stairs, I passed out, and I couldn't find my cabin on the ship, and I woke up the next day covered in, like, puke and bruises. Mm. Um, and I, I knew. I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Like, I found it. I yep. found the substance that made everything okay. The golden key. The golden key. Um, it made... It made me be able to talk to boys, and it made me funny and smart, and it made me be able to interact with other human beings, and I could dance, which I probably couldn't dance. I just thought I could, but, like, it was the solution to the problem, which was myself and my life. Yeah, sometimes um, dancing is not a can. It's a do. <laughs> I did dance. Whether if I could or not, oh, that's one was, thing, but I did. It was something. Yeah, it was a good time. Because um, I wasn't going to dance without some alcohol on me. That's for oh, no. damn sure. <laughs> no, no, no. I was too modest and shy for all that. But as soon as I started drinking, everything was fine. Um, <clears throat> so from that moment on, uh, I decided that I was going to drink whenever I could. And it started out really harmlessly. It really did. Um, maybe just on the weekends or something, you know, if someone's parent was out of town and we found a bottle of Boone's Farm or, you know, something, just normal teenage experimentation. Um, and what I could honestly tell you is that if none of the other situations happened after, that it probably would have stayed like that, really. Um, but some situations that, that you'll hear about in a little while that happened after I started drinking was like the perfect storm to become an alcoholic. Like the stars lined up. There was really actually no reason why I shouldn't become an alcoholic. Um, but at that point, I still had my mother. I still had social support. I had friends. Like it could have just stayed like a sweet, innocent little thing. Hmm. Um, the other thing that happened when I was 13 um, like a normal kid is I started doing some of the things like sneaking out, staying out all night, lying about where I was going. Um, and my mother being the classic codependent, that did not go over well. Um, to be fair in her defense, I did not realize why um, she would be upset that like a 13, 14, 15 year old would be staying out all night. Like what's I did the big not, deal? Yeah. What's the big deal? Like I'm grown. Um, I know everything. It's fine. Um and in hindsight, I could not imagine what it would be like to not know where my 13, 14, 15 year old child is. So that's decently upsetting. Um, we started counseling at that time. Um, not, not for anything with me other than my behaviors, because those were the problem, of course. And we went to the counselor and I proceeded to convince the counselor that I was perfectly fine and my mother was crazy. Which, to be fair, could have been an honest evaluation of the situation. It really could have. Um, so that didn't go the way that she wanted to. So that went downhill. Um, We're not going back to that therapist. <laughs> right. Or we tried therapy. It doesn't work. Because um, they're just crazy. You're the one with the problem. Um, so I got another boyfriend. And he was okay. And really, that's about how most of my relationships went my entire life. Like, they really liked me, and I thought they were okay. 
so I gave it a shot. Um, and usually they lasted for some years, which is fine. Um, <laughs> even though they should not have lasted more than a month, but it's okay. Um, and it's really fascinating because if you look back, even before I went into alcoholism and addiction, like I attracted them because this guy is an alcoholic yeah. to this day. Like just the sickness attracted the sickness. Basically. It's interesting how that magnetism kind of thing, mm-hmm. how that happens even like before we know that it's in place. Yep. The broken attract the broken. And so he proposed to me when I was 15 Um, I really wouldn't have married him. I really wouldn't have, but it freaked my mom out. So I loved every second of it. Um, and that was like the beginning of the end. So, uh, I come home one day and she's like, I'm going to send you to your dad's for a couple weeks so you can get to know him. And I obviously knew I didn't have a choice in the matter because I was 15, but I was like, that's fine. Whatever. Um, She flew me up to Reno, Nevada, which is where my dad was living. I got off the plane to this man that I hadn't seen in years and I didn't know. And he said, your mom doesn't want you anymore. You're staying here with me. Mm -hmm. And I was crushed, right? Um, It was exactly the, like, you know, when I say our spirit has been stepped on, that's a giant big term for those. (laughs) I mean, that is a crushing step. That's a stomp on my spirit. Because already, like, he had made it clear that he didn't want me. And so she was the only thing that I had left, regardless of our issues and our relationship struggles. Like, she was all I had ever had. So for her not to want me, like, okay, that's fine. Um, That was, like, the second to the last blow that sealed alcoholism in my life, really. Um, So my dad's an alcoholic, like I told you. Um, I spent two weeks up there being the good con manipulator I was. I called my mother and I threw a fit and I said, I'm going to call CPS on you for sending me up here to an active alcoholic. Um, you know, and I whined and I complained and she agreed to take me back after the two weeks was up. Mm. Um, those two weeks were pretty rough. Um, he's not a nice drunk by this point. Um, And so what I do remember is like he was on his second DUI. So we had to walk everywhere and I hated that. Um, But what he did do was he took me to my first AA meeting. Um, And we walked into this little room in Reno, Nevada. And it was a bunch of old white dudes. And I looked around and I was like, yeah, you guys look like alcoholics. You need to keep coming back. Um, And I walked out. And on that day, I vowed that I would never be like my father. And I kept that vow. Um, I I became much, much worse than he ever was. Um, So I go back to Arizona with my mother. And now she has a new idea of what's going to fix everything. Um, So we moved to Las Vegas, Nevada when I'm 15 and a half. And I don't know why she thought moving to Las Vegas, Nevada with a potential alcoholic was a great idea. But she was going to find out. Um... So we moved to Las Vegas, and this was the third and final straw that would set me off the rails into alcoholism, because now you have taken any friends and any social support that I had and placed me in a new city where I don't have it at all. So I'm 100% alone. Um, Also, from that moment, I hated that woman. Like, I set out to make her life living hell, Mm. because you don't want me, that's fine. I'll show you. I will do anything to harm you that I possibly can. Yeah. Um, and so we go to Las Vegas and we're in one of the richest parts of the city and I'm at one of the richest high schools and I'm not enough because I'm just driving a Mustang convertible and everybody else is driving BMWs and Jaguars and Audis and, you know, um, I just don't fit. I don't fit. But I found where I fit and it was with people... Um, Using substances, right? Because people using substances don't really care. Yeah. Like, they just don't have it in them to care. Yeah, what you're driving. What, what's about <laughs> you. You know, none of that stuff. Um, so, I met this girl, um, and I started smoking weed. And mind you, I was, a, um, I was a graduate of the D.A.R.E. program. Like, I had taken the vow of celibacy from substances, like, all that stuff, you know, the devil's lettuce. Um, and I remember 
when I first tried marijuana that I was like, well, they lied. Yeah. This stuff isn't bad. Like, this is amazing. Like, all I want to do is laugh and eat. Like, we had a ball for like a couple months. Like, we would, I'd go over to her house. We would watch Pirates of the Caribbean every night and just get stoned. And it was great. Like, it was amazing. And I had a friend. Um, but I was in that downward spiral. Um, so within six months, I had tried all of the substances. I like them and I like them all. I like them all together. One substance does not get me where I want to be. I like all of them. And my other addiction is men, obviously. Um, and I don't really discriminate in those either. Yours, mine, his, hers, it doesn't matter. Um, so I won't tell you that it wasn't a good time because it was. And I don't think anybody would continue doing it if it wasn't a good time for a while. Yeah. It was. It always it was, works for a while. Yeah, and it did. It worked. From 16 to 17, like, it was amazing. Um, I was going places I shouldn't have been going. I was hanging out with people I should not have been hanging out with. I was doing lots of things I should not have been doing, basically. Um The, one of the turning points when it stopped being fun, um, I had been up, it was the morning after 420, I had been up all night, I had mixed a bunch of uppers and all, all the stuff, basically. I had mixed all the stuff. Um, I was driving to school that morning after not sleeping, and I looked down to change a radio station, and I put my Mustang underneath the back of a parked semi, um, which... To most people would be like, wow, I have a problem. <laughs> like, I should probably not keep doing this. Um, but really, all it did was push me over the edge because that car was all that I had that I cared about. So, um, I had a boyfriend come pick me up before the cops came because they could not find me at the scene the way that I was. Um, you knew enough to do that. I huh? did. And he took care of all that. Once again, no consequences, no big deal. Really? Um, yeah. My mom was pissed, but... Yeah, but no legal repercussions. No, no, no. I mean, and she wasn't mad for a while. She just said she wasn't going to buy me another car that I would have to work for one, which was fine. Um, but that day I proceeded to take a stupid amount of pills because I wanted to die. Hmm. Like... That car was all that I cared about. It was all I had. I didn't have anybody. I didn't have anything except the substances. And I had lost that car. It was like... And it sounds really silly because it was just a car. But it was like all I had. Um, so I didn't die, obviously. And uh, it just progressed to get worse and worse after that. Um at 17, I met the boy who introduced me to the substance, um, and I fell in love with the substance. The boy was okay, but he could get the substance, so we liked him. Um, and the first time I ever did the substance, I was driving back to school, and I guess I nodded out, and as I was pulling in the parking lot, I got pulled over. And that should have been, like, a decent consequence. Like, I'm high on heroin, and I get pulled over pulling into school. And what I did was I just cried, and I was like, my boyfriend just broke up with me. I'm just getting to school. I'm just trying to do the right thing. And the cop let me go. Yeah. Um, and once again, my brain registered <clears throat> success. Like, cool, no consequences. I can continue doing what I want to do. Um by 17, I graduated uh, with a 4.025 GPA, but I did not have enough attendance to graduate because when I get high, I don't go to school. So I went to the office lady and I whined and I complained and she changed my attendance. And that's the only reason that I graduated when I was supposed to. Hmm. Um, I did graduate with a full ride scholarship to the university out there. Um so I attempted doing that for about a month and a half, but already at 17 years old, I was a full-time heroin junkie, and I really couldn't sit in the class for an hour and 15 minutes. I just couldn't. Yeah, um, you just yeah, that's not. It's not <laughs> as important. <laughs> yeah, these operating this you just can't. That's a, unsustainable. You just cannot 
uh, do productive things and 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 maintain that state of mind. You, no, nobody's ever been a functioning functioning heroin addict, yeah, right. which is what I always wanted to be. Um, so That's after a-, a month and a half, I gave that up. Um, I would love to tell you Water. that um, when I turned eighteen. I was doing great big things and like I moved out and got my own place, but that's not actually what it looked like. Um, What it looked like was I turned 18. I came home and my mother said, pack your stuff. Um, You have been disrespecting me in this house for long enough. You can go. Um, So that boy and I moved in with his mother because what good alcoholic and addict won't, won't live with somebody's mother. And um, I will even say it's my house and proceed to act like it's my house. So moved in with his mother, um, still doing the same type of stuff, but I discovered that drugs are really, really expensive. And so you can do something like work a nine to five job and like make minimum wage and be told what to do. And I don't like being told what to do. Or you can go into sales and distribution. Um, so I chose to go into sales and distribution. What I need to tell you is how some kids wanted to be like a doctor and a lawyer and a nurse when they grew up. I wanted to be a gangster. Um, I wanted to be like Tony Montana. I liked fast, fast cars, fast boys, fast money. That looked really good to me. And my first CD was Coolio Gangster's Paradise. Um, if I could have done my hair in twisties, I would have. I don't have good enough (laughs) hair, but it was like... That's what I aspired to do with my life. My 4.025 GPA, and I wanted to be a gangster. Um, At 18. 17. 17. I'm still 17. (laughs) 17. (laughs) So we move into his mom's house, who has probably like 18 years sober at this time. Um, And we continue to disrespect her house by selling things and doing things and all kinds of stuff. Um, Is she aware? Um, if she is, she's not letting it out. She's she she knows, but there's that really fine line between like enabling and like just loving somebody. And like she knew that if we weren't staying there, we would have nowhere to stay. So she wasn't willing to put us out on the street. Um, so I turned eighteen, and literally fifteen days after I turned eighteen, we got arrested. Um, I caught my first felony drug charges. I got seven different felony drug charges. Um, We went to jail. I was in jail for two days, and it was awful. Gangster me cried the entire time. (laughs) Um, My bunkie braided my hair and taught me how to to play cards, and I decided that I was never going back to jail. Like, I was not meant for jail. Me and jail don't do well together. Let's just not do that again. Um, So I go in front of the judge, and I've only been in trouble once before as a juvenile before this and once again I didn't really get any consequences for that so I go in front of the judge and I say your honor it's not me it's this boy it's this place it's these people if I can just get away from them everything will be fine and he believed me and um, he dropped it to one felony drug charge and he said if you can stay out of trouble for a whole year you'll have nothing on your record Mm. And that is an amazing deal, except for somebody that's an alcoholic. Um, About this time, my mom started to get really, really sick. And in hindsight, I should have known something was wrong because she was a really healthy person. Um, But I was getting high. So, like, I really didn't know anything, nor did I particularly care. Um, The boy and I packed up all our stuff. We did the geographical cure. We moved down to Arizona where I grew up. Because it's not us, it's this place, it's these people, if we can get away we gotta from we got to get out of here. Yeah. It'll be like, it's really not us. Um, so we moved down to Arizona. Within eight hours of being down there, I found what I wanted. Because anywhere I go, I can find it. And so basically all I did was transplant my addiction from one state to the other. And I am on probation now for a year in Arizona. Um, and they really don't play, which is kind of funny. Um So my mom started to get really, really sick. She goes back to Canada to see the doctors, and she gets diagnosed with stage 4 lung and colon cancer. Um, 
I don't know if I didn't realize what cancer was, if I was just in delusion or denial, but what that looked like was that I was lying to her telling her I was sober, and she was lying to me telling me that the chemo and radiation was getting getting Working. better, and that the cancer was going away, and everything was great. Um, I got a call one day from a doctor, and he said, you need to get up here, your mom's not going to make it. And I said, what are you talking about? She's getting better. And he said, no, she's not. You need to get up here. She's not going to make it. So I hopped on a plane up to Canada. Thank God they didn't have body scanners and all that stuff back then. Um, I took what I needed to take with me, you know. And I spent three days up there. Um, the last three days of that woman's life, she died in my arms. And every four hours, I was in that hospital bathroom doing what I needed to do to not be sick. Yeah. Um, yeah, you want to talk about choices? That you, when that rings the bell, a bell ringer again on this thing when people say we're making choices to do drugs, you know, and yeah, at some point maybe, but you're not choosing at that time. That thing has yeah. got its hooks in you, and, and you're not choosing to do anything but what it wants you to do. Oh, by 17, I lost the power of choice. Like yeah. that invisible line that they talk about, whatever that is, I lost it it's, by 17. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful my bottom was that low because I think it's, and I hate to say it, but I think it's easier for people with really, really low bottoms to get and stay sober because it was really bad. Like, I think if you have a high bottom and you still have some stuff, you can kind of romance it and be like, eh, maybe it wasn't that bad. Maybe I could do it again. And I'm like, fuck no. Yeah. Like, we rode that all the way out. Yeah, and that, you know, it shows up when people come bouncing in and out, and I'm a, I'm a result of that, of bouncing in and out and having the, the, the stuff get worse and worse and worse until it finally crossed that threshold where I do something about it, you know, and when you hit bottom hard, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that gift of desperation that comes along with that is, mm -hmm. is truly a gift. Yeah. So you're up there doing dope in the hospital yeah. while she's dying and actually does... It yes. Pass away. So she died. Um, and so a couple different things happened. Number one, I completely lost my shit. If I had have had it before that <laughs> point, had any shit. <laughs> if I had any, it was gone, right? Because now I'm super conflicted. Like, did I hate her? Yes. Did part of me love her? Yes. Was she the only parent that, that I had ever had? Yes. Like, so I'm completely alone. Like, it's me and the world. The boy is in the picture, but so it's me and substances in the world all alone. Um, the other thing that happened is I inherited three quarters of a million dollars. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if she actually meant for me to get that money right then. Like she was fully aware of my addiction and me being a heroin addict. Um, even though we had never had a conversation about it other than like, don't tell our family that you're doing heroin. Uh, but she was fully aware of what it was. So I inherited all this money and like, honestly, if I had have been sober, I could still be living off that money right now. And it sounds like a lot of money, but to an addict and an alcoholic, it's really not. Um, so I go back to Arizona. The boy and I are in parole and probation one day. Um, they tell us that we can't be together unless, you know, you're a married couple and he gets down on one knee and he says, baby, I love you. Will you marry me? In the middle of parole and probation. And I said, abso freaking -lutely. Like, who doesn't want to be pr pr this, proposed to? Uh, we can like, invent a solution to this problem yeah, really quickly. Yeah. And, like, it was gangster. Like, it lined up with my gangster plan. Yeah, how we can cool tell is the this? kids, right? We'll tell the kids that dad proposed to mom in parole and probation. So, <laughs> we went to the strip. Um, we got married on the strip. We spent our honeymoon in a weekly hotel doing what we like to do. Because you had enough money to do what you wanted to do. I had more than enough money to kill myself and all of the nearest human beings, basically. Um, within two months of getting married... Um, I got arrested again, and what the next year and a half of my look, of my life looked like is I'm getting arrested constantly. Um, it started out like every three months, and then it went to every two months, and then it went to month, and then it went to two weeks, and like three or four days. It's just a revolving door. Um, the cops all knew me by name. There was pictures of me everywhere as a person of interest in all these things. Um, 
And every time I would go to jail and some technicality, they would let me out, Hmm. you know. And what I will say for the state of Nevada is they did everything they possibly could to try to help me. Like, they added extra probation. They sent me to counseling. They put me in drug court. They did all of this stuff. And um, I couldn't stop. I just couldn't. So... By the end of the year and a half, I'm 20 years old. I'm on my way to prison for the very first time. Um, Gangster me cries the whole time because I've seen Law & Order. I've seen CSI. Prison doesn't look like a good thing. Um, But I went to prison and it was amazing. Like, I loved it. It was like summer camp. Um, We got to wear real clothes. We got to eat good food. I got to work. I got to start going back to college again. Like, I did really well in a controlled environment. If someone oversaw me and told me when to do, what to do, all that good stuff, I could do it. Um, And they sent me to a six-month drug class, and I think the only thing that I learned from that was that I probably shouldn't do heroin. Like, I could do all the rest of the stuff. What's that look like when you show up in jail addicted? Do they detox you, or do you just go lay and suffer? Um, It depends on what state you're in. Because in Nevada, they actually will detox you, which is really sweet. Like, they'll give you Librium. So that's what happened with you? Yeah, so in Vegas, they'll detox you. They'll give you Librium and Clotidine and for a couple days, and it helps. Um, in Kentucky, nothing. Put, nothing. You, put you in a cell and let you squirm. With the lights on for like 24 hours a day. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know that from experience, too? I do, we're getting there. <laughs> we're not there yet, but I do know that from experience. Thinking, uh, yeah, I, I, my head initially when you started talking about matters what state you're in, my head was uh, was saying, well, I'm asking you about where you were at, but then uh, now it's come back around that uh, that's not the only place you've experienced that. <laughs> oh no, 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 we're getting there. Um, so I go to prison. It was great. They let me out. Um, I had six months on parole, which is really not a long time. How long actually. were you in? Do what? How long were you in that time? Fourteen months. Uh, so I spent my 21st birthday in prison the first time, and that's probably the only reason I survived it. Like, I fully believe that. So, um, I get out. I'm still 21. Uh, I had six months on parole to do, which is not a long time. (laughs) And that just drinking and that just smoking lasted for maybe two weeks. Maybe. And I get back out, and I pick right back up where I left off. Um, because I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't have any tools. That was all I had. Um, so my parole officer called me in and she sat me down and she's like, Miss Tyree, I don't know what to do with you. Like you have six months on parole and you can't stop using. And I was like, I know that's a problem. And she's like, well, I'm just going to stop drug testing you. Stop. Stop. And I thought I won the lottery. Like I hit the jackpot. Fantastic. I can do what I want to do with no consequences. Um, looking back on it, what it really says is that, um, there was no hope for me. And she knew there was no hope for me. So sending me back to prison for a couple months wasn't going to do anything. I just wasn't worth her time, basically, Mm. is what it says. Um, That husband and I, his family's from northern Kentucky. So his mother had gone back up there. um, And we decided it's not us. It's this place. It's these people. If we can get away from them, everything will be fine. So we move up to northern Kentucky. Um, And I hated it. Like, Kentucky's cold, it snows, people talk really funny, I didn't know anybody, I hated every minute of it. I was also sick for, like, the first month that I was here, which is the longest that I'd ever been sick for in my entire life, so it was awful. Um, Dope sick or just sick? Dope sick, for sure. I don't know if I was ever really sick before I got sober. If I was, it was covered by the dope sick, so I don't know. Um... And every day that man would go to work and every day he would come home and he would say, baby, I love you. And I would say, I hate you. I hate you for bringing me here. I hate you. I hate you because I'm a victim and it's not my fault that I'm here doing what I'm doing. It's your fault and I'm going to blame you. Um, And after about a month of being up in northern Kentucky, he comes home from work one day and he says, how would you feel if I found what you wanted to do? I said, that sounds fantastic. Um, what I did not realize is they do things a little differently out in Kentucky than we do back home. Um, one of my yets and one of my nevers was IV drug use. Um, you know, I'm not a real junkie cause I don't shoot up. You were snorting it before? Uh, well in Vegas smoke you it. smoke it. Smoke it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but believe when that time came, 
Um, I had no problem doing what I needed to do to get what I needed to get. Um, within two weeks of, of starting that and picking back up, I caught my third felony charge. Um, Kentucky really doesn't like it if you get more than one, which is uh, absolutely fascinating because Nevada doesn't care how many you get. But Kentucky doesn't like it. Hmm. And they have this thing called persistent felony offender, which is like an enhancement. And it adds like 10 to 15 years on your sentence automatically if you have more than one felony. Um, I would love to tell you that I saved this girl's life and gave her CPR because I'm a great human being and I knew that she had small children. Um, but the only reason I saved her life and gave her CPR was because I didn't want to get caught with a dead body. I'd already been to prison once. If you found me with somebody overdosed, I'm going for a really long time. Um, we did get charged with everything that was in the house and that's where I got that third felony from. Um, I did have some of that money from my mother's inheritance. I hired the best drug attorney there was, and I got probation. Um, don't ask me how they gave a three-time felon probation. I'm sure the judges and, and the lawyers play golf. Maybe their kids date. Like, I don't know what that looks like. Um, but the problem, once again, with probation is they do that dumb thing called drug testing. Mm -hmm. And I just cannot pass a drug test. I study really, really yeah, hard, and I can't pass it. I'm really good at all the tests I've ever taken. All the tests. Except for that That's guy. the only one that I can't pass. Um, so, but what the state of Kentucky did do is they sent me to my first halfway house. Um, and I went to my first halfway house, and I would have told you that I was sober for the month that I was there because I was mainly just drinking and smoking. And so if anybody out there thinks that's sober, that's fantastic. Keep coming back. Like, I honestly believed that for a long time. Um, but what I didn't realize is I put everybody in the house in danger, right? Because when I'm not sober, I don't care about you trying to be sober. I don't care about your safety. I don't care about any of the liability. Like, I don't care. Um, and so finally, after a month, the house got hip enough and caught me. And they put me out and I'm on the run. Um, I don't do really well on the run. I'm tall. I'm loud. I had two different color hair at the time. Like I stand out. So the run lasted for maybe two or three months and I caught my fourth felony. Um, and this time I knew I was going back to prison. Like I knew that's fine. How long are you going to send me? Cause they, um, persistent felony offended me again. So I was facing like 15 to 25 years wow. on a fourth dope case. Um, and I remember standing in the courtroom and the DA was like, your honor, she's a menace to society. And I was looking around like, who is this dude talking about? He's not talking about me, little old me. I've never hurt anybody but myself. Yeah. You honestly could not tell me that I had hurt anybody ever in my whole life other than me. Um, I got six and a half years and I was really, really happy to take six and a half years. Um, so I was excited. I'm going back to prison. I really like prison. Kentucky doesn't do prison um, unless you have a really, really long time or some really serious charges. So I did all of my 20 months in county jail facilities, um, which is awful, by the way. Absolutely awful. But what I did know is when I came up for parole this time, I knew they were going to send me to a substance abuse program. I already knew that's what the state of Kentucky does. It's like Oprah. You get a sap, and you get a sap, and you get a sap. Like, they were sending everybody to substance abuse treatment. Um, all I wanted to know was where was I going, right? Because I wanted to go outside of facility. Um, I wanted to go to, like, the Healing Place or the Hope Center or the Chrysalis House because all I cared about was wearing my own clothes, smoking cigarettes, eating good food, and talking to boys. Yes, I said talking to boys. Yes, I was still married. That should tell you what kind of wife I was. Um, and when they told me to roll it up, it was time to go. I was stoked. And I was like, where am I going? And they said, you're going to Hardin County SAP. Um, Hardin County Substance Abuse Program was the hardest program in the state of Kentucky at the time. Um, and it is in facility. It is in a jail facility. You do not leave. Um, and so I cried all the way because I'm a gangster, and I cried the whole way, and I got there, um, and up to this point, I was, like, already a year off the substances in jail, and, like, I can honestly tell you the only thing I wanted to do was get out and continue doing what I'd been doing. That, yeah, that was, was another thing that crossed my mind, is that, uh, that you did stay, when you were in, behind bars, when you were in prison jail, you stayed sober behind bars. 
Oh, yeah, in a controlled yeah. environment. That, uh, I hear, yeah. and I don't know this, but I hear that's not necessarily required, that people still find ways to do things inside there. So I was curious if which what side of that you landed on. Yeah, no, they do. Um, I think, so when I get sober, I get kind of bougie. And my thing was like, I know how those drugs got in here. I don't want your butt drugs. Hmm. That's basically yeah. like, okay. I'm too good for butt drugs. So I'll just be sober in jail. Plus, I didn't think it sounded like a good time mm-hmm. to be like locked in a concrete cell on substances and having cops walk by and look at you. Like nothing about that sounds like enjoyable or a good time to me. So I did stay sober. Um, I get to treatment and the only thing I want to do is complete whatever stupid program they want me to complete so I can get out and do what I like to yep. do. Let me um, jump through your hoops. and Yes, basically. Um, only because, like, I didn't know anybody that was sober. I didn't. Nobody where I grew up or came from got sober. That wasn't a thing. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there was, but not anybody that I knew. Um, Same thing at 45 years old. I, I I didn't know anybody that was like sober. I couldn't no. think of somebody that go, hey, if, who do I know to call? Yeah. That would no. be like, hey, oh, I know so-and-so. He's been sober a little bit. I, right. I, I didn't have any of that. Now, there, you know, subsequently, I found that there's been some people I knew <laughs> that right. were sober, but I sure didn't know it at the time. No. And I'd been it court really ordered alone. to those meetings since I was 18. Yeah. And I'm sure they said like the steps every time I went in. And right. I'm sure they said things like sponsorship and stuff. But I didn't hear any of that. Yeah. Well, we have that. Uh, I had a DUI. My first one was at 16 and got court ordered to to, to, to AA and didn't have any idea. But I had a friend, a girlfriend's older brother said, oh, I know where a meeting is. And so he we he took me to my, I only had to go to three. But I don't remember. <clears throat> yeah, I remember old men, mm-hmm. cigarette smoke, and coffee. And that's the only thing I can remember. I was, it was actually down at the carriage house down here in New Albany. I do remember, though, there's that layer of smoke in there about right here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were all full of shit, basically. I thought they had figured out, like, a way to use successfully, um, or at least people, like, keep people off their back, yeah. basically, was what I yeah. thought. Yeah, those three meetings there, and, and that would have, you know, damn, I, I, well, I was 16, so it was, trying to do math and i can't do it but it uh that's the out of all the other times i got in trouble that's the only time they ever made me go to aa and i do not recall a thing about it mm-hmm. besides what i just said but i mean yeah because i didn't have and enough wherewithal to like, even think that they were full of shit you know i mean at 16 i didn't need to be there this is this is this is hoop jumping yeah it wasn't a problem um and i can honestly tell you even going to prison the second time i really didn't think it was a problem i just thought like if everybody would leave me the fuck alone that it would be fine like i was born a junkie i was gonna die a junkie just like some people are meant to be doctors and lawyers like somebody's got to be on the other side of the spectrum and that's what i was supposed to be would you just leave me the fuck alone based i mean (laughs) let me ride it all the way out um And so I got to treatment and they did this really dumb thing called accountability. And I really didn't understand it because I was four time felon and really, really criminal. um, And it sounded a lot like snitching to me. So I did not fully understand accountability, but there is a difference, right? So accountability is when I come to you and I'm like, hey, Dan, I see you doing this. You might want to take a look at that right so that's me bringing it to you snitching is when i go to like the program director the cops to somebody else but there's a fine line there and it took me a while to figure it out um so the first month and a half that i was in that program i was on the fake it till you make it um just doing a bunch of criminal shit thinking that i was flying under the radar and a month and a half in i get called into the director's office and he's like tomorrow i don't know what to do with you Um, you're wasting the best opportunity that you've ever been given. And for the first time in my life, I had nothing to say. I had nothing to say. And if you know me, I always have something to say. Because he was 100% right. I was wasting the best opportunity that I'd ever been given. I'd never been sent to treatment before. I'd never even had it as an option. Um, So he sent me back to my cell. And I'm not going to say that I caught jailhouse religion because I still don't do religion. Me and Jesus have agreed to see other people. But um, I did say my first honest prayer for help. And that to me is the surrender. It's like, if there is anything out there, I am willing to do something different. And that's all I said. Um, And to me, surrendering to this day is like, I don't know what to do and asking for help. 
that's as simple as it is. We throw the word around a lot in recovery circles. It's like, oh, you just have to surrender. But we never really say what the fuck it is. Like, it's just being willing to admit that my way isn't working and maybe I should ask for help. Um, and after that, I got the opportunity to stay in that program. And that was the turning point. Um, I started working the 12 steps. Um, and the game changer was when I got to step two. In the book, it says, why... Ebby says to Bill, why don't you pick your own conception of a higher power? And that was a game changer for me because I grew up Methodist. I grew up with the hellfire and the sinning and the damnation. And that kind of God would not have got me sober. A punishing God can't do that. So I picked my own conception. um, And I picked kind of like a hippie earthy thing like the moon and the wind and the sun and the star and the skies. Um, And that's still kind of what my conception is today. Um, and I really don't plan on changing it because it's worked for the last nine years. Um, I got to step three and they're like, turn your life and your will over. And I was like, whatever. Because you really don't fully grasp the concept. You're just going through the motions. Um, I got to step four and I think somebody explained it to me wrong. Um, they might not have, but I heard it wrong either way. What I heard was that I was going to get to sit down with somebody and tell them how everyone in my whole life had wronged me. And I was stoked. Like, I was overjoyed. So Give me I, the mic. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, this is my time to shine. From little Susie that was like four years old that touched my shit. I didn't like her. So um, I wrote down a, a really thorough four-step. Um, and I put the things on there that I didn't want to put on there. And I walk into this room with this girl that they brought in to do my fifth step. Um, and I'm still actually friends with her today, which is kind of cool. That is cool. Um and so you didn't pick her no no we're in facility i'm in jail so they just brought in random people that i'd never seen before in my life um and i hated her too right because she was everything that i wanted to be she was cute and she was little and she was young and she was sober and she was free so i hated her on sight um so i walk into this little visitation room to do my fifth step And my game plan going into it was that I'm going to tell this girl the worst things that I've ever done. She is going to run screaming out of the room. I'm going to say that I tried and I'm going to complete the program. It's going to be great. Like that was my goal. So I go in there and I start spitting out the worst things that I've ever done. Um, And something magical happened. You know, she started telling me the worst things that she'd ever done. And in my in my experience, that's how a fourth and fifth step should be. It should be give and take. It should not be one sided. And that girl won my entire confidence that day. Yeah, I was Uh, taught that we exchange fifth mm -hmm. steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if not, what's what's the reason for me to trust you if I'm just telling you all my stuff and you're just sitting there staring at me like that does not um, encourage any kind of trust or relationship building. So I walked out of that fifth step um, and I felt light. I felt like a cup, like somebody had flipped me over and emptied everything out of me. I didn't know it at the time, but that was my first spiritual experience. Yeah, that's cool. Um, And and I'm I'm really glad that it happened then because honestly, I don't know if I would have kept doing the rest of the steps. Like my higher power knew that I needed it really early on. Um so we got to eight and nine. They, she said I had character defects. I didn't really believe it. I got to eight and nine. Um, they were like, pick five people and write letters. And I was like, cool. So I picked the five people I knew would forgive me because I'm still really, really criminal. And I completed your program. And I was excited. Um, and they were like, where do you want to go for aftercare? And I was like, I don't think I need aftercare. I think I'm just fine. And he was like, no, I'm going to send you to Louisville. And I was like, I don't want to go to Louisville. I don't know anybody there. All they have is bourbon and horses. Because that's what you call it if you've never been here is Louisville. Um, So I ended up in Louisville. Um, What I wanted to do was I wanted to go back up north with that husband of mine. And what I didn't realize at the time was my higher power was doing for me what I would not do for myself. Because he was not sober even though he was telling me that he was. Um, So I get out. They put me in a halfway house down here. Um, six month program and the halfway house afforded me a bunch of opportunities that I had never had Um, because if you're an alcoholic like me like I'm unemployable I don't pay bills like I just don't I don't do anything socially acceptable so they were like you got to tell us where you're going and I was like well that's bullshit and they're like get a job and I was like I don't think I really need one and they're like get one anyways um 
And so I started to learn some things, you know. Um, I baby steps into being an adult. I got my first job. Um, I went on my very first um, interview in a see-through shirt and a Playboy belt. Um, only because I didn't know what I didn't know. Like, nobody told me that you had to dress differently than you did every day for a job interview. And I got the job. It wasn't based on any skills or qualifications, so I'll leave it up to you why I got the job. (laughs) Um, but I stayed at that job for two years, you know, and I hated the job, but the point was that I stayed and I showed up and I worked and I made money and I did what I needed to do. Um, And so in that time, that boy, the husband finally told me he wasn't sober, so I had to get rid of him. And every good codependent needs a new man when they get rid of another man. So I picked my new boss. Um, If you've never dated anybody that you work with, please don't. I did it for you. It doesn't work (laughs) out well. Um, But what they told me in recovery is I needed to flip everything 180, right? So I did. Like, I picked a guy that had never been drunk in his whole life college educated, worked two jobs, um, had a child, was like doing the responsible, cool thing. Like I, it was beautiful. It would have been beautiful. Um, and that, that relationship lasted for, I don't know, I want to say two years. Um, and it was real mentally and emotionally abusive. And by the, the beginning, I was probably a victim, but by the end of it, I'm a willing participant. Um, cause I can give it back as good as I can take it. And so I completed that halfway house and my best thinking was like, move into your own apartment, move him in with you, um, build the white picket fence, live the dream. You don't need AA. You don't need these people. Just don't use substances. That's what my brain said. So that's what I commenced to do. Um, the next year and a half of my life, um, I did not work any kind of program. I was a dry, drunk, dry alcoholic, whatever you want to call it, um, And my best thinking told me that I should come off my birth control. I should trick him into getting me pregnant. He would be so happy that he would propose to me and we would just live happily ever after. Um, And once again, like I said, I'm a planner, but I forget to tell the other people involved. Um, So I did that and I got pregnant and I told him and he was not happy. Like, he was not happy. He did not want a child. He did not want to get married to me. So I had a really important choice to make. Um, I could pick the child that I wanted, but I didn't have yet, or I could pick the man that I had made my higher power when I left the fellowship. Um, you know, and I share that to say that you can do anything sober that you did when you were getting high. It just sucks a lot more. So I got that abortion. Um, and you know, we tried to make it work. We tried like a year and a half after that to make it work. But the problem was that I hated myself for doing that. I hated him for not wanting the child and not wanting to marry me. And I hated his four-year-old daughter because he already had her and he loved her. And that's how sick I can get. I can hate a four-year-old child that never did anything to me. Mm. Um, We tried everything to make it work. We bought the house. We put up a Christmas tree. I hate Christmas. Like, (laughs) we tried to make it like Norman fucking Rockwell. Um, And at the end of that year and a half, he looked at me and he said, I hate you. Get out of my house. Um, in classic alcoholic style, I hung on for like another three months living in the spare bedroom of my own house. And I allowed that man to disrespect me by staying out all night and by bringing other women into the home. Um, cause my codependency was like, why don't you love me? Look at all the stuff I've done for you. Like, why don't you love me? Why am I not good enough? Um, so I was like three and a half years sober or dry by this point, um, and I was ready to kill myself. I was ready to die every single day because I knew substances didn't work anymore, so I figured death was like going to be the solution, and I thought about driving off the bridge. I thought about driving my car into a retaining wall because it had to be dramatic because you were going to feel bad for me even if I was dead, right? Um, And it crossed my mind one day that the only time I had been happy was, was in the program, like ever, sober. Um, so I picked up the phone and I called my old sponsor. I said, Hey, will you sponsor me again? And she said, baby girl, I never stop sponsoring. You stop calling me. Are you ready to do some work? And I said, yes, ma'am. Um, so I can honestly tell you, I did not work a good program for the first four years of my recovery. And I wouldn't suggest that for anybody, but it just worked out the way that it did for me. Um, so I moved out of my own house. Of course, the guy that helped me move is the next one that I started dating. (laughs) Of course. 
But the cool thing about this one was that he was in the rooms and he worked a really, really good program. Mm. And so what he did for me was he helped me get back in the middle of recovery. Mm. And we were going out doing things with young people and we were staying out all night um, at the Waffle House until three in the morning, just laughing and cutting up. And he helped me get back in the middle of it. And we never should have dated, but that was his purpose was um, to help me get back in the middle and start working a good program. Um, so I'm like 27 by this time. I finally move into my own apartment, which I've never had. I never lived by myself. Like it was super scary. Um, and what I had to decided to do at like two years sober was go back to school. You know, that was one of the things that I always wanted to do. Um, but you can't do that when you're getting high and going to prison. So I started going back to, to school um, at two years sober and I graduated with my bachelor's degree in 2015. Um, and that's something that I was really proud of. You know, you can't take that away from me. Um, what also happened in 2015 was I met the one. And I mean the one. Like clouds parted, the birds sang, like sunlight shone down. Um, what also need to tell you, he was like two months sober in a men's halfway house when I met him, but that's okay because he was the one. Um, and so he moved in and like it was beautiful and it was great and it was everything that I had ever wanted for six months. Like we bought a house, we were going on vacations, we bought a motorcycle, like it was beautiful. And then one day I come home and the man tells me, um, I'm not sober and I don't know what to do. And my entire world crashed. And I said, okay, what are, what are we going to do about this? And the next year and a half of my life looked like um, sending him to treatment multiple times in Florida, sending him here, sending him there, him doing this, him doing that. Um, and, and what the main emphasis of that is we, right? We were trying to get him sober. He was not trying to get sober. I was trying to get him sober. Um, and at the end of that year and a half, I had to let that situation go because it got really bad. Like the car being gone for days, the savings being gone, lots of other women, like it got really, really bad. Um, and that was the hardest thing that I've ever been through in recovery was to watch somebody else, um, battle their own addiction and turn into somebody that I didn't even know. I watched my best friend turn into somebody that I didn't even know, um, but a couple of different things happened because of that. Number one, um, I started to go to Al-Anon a little bit, you know, which is our sister program. Um, and they say that AA helps with the substances and Al-Anon helps with personal relationships. And that's been my experience. So I got another tool to put in my tool belt. Um, and then the other thing it did provide me was um, empathy for the newcomers, you know, because um, relapse is not in my story yet. So I, I don't have a full grasp of what it is like to come in and struggle. Um, but watching him gave me empathy and respect for the people that get back up and continue to come in. And what I like to say is um, get a white chip every time, man. And if somebody tries to give you a hard time, tell them you're making a fucking belt. And if they have a problem, come see me. Yeah. Like, yep. please keep I coming agree. back. Absolutely. I would rather have you in the meeting for an hour higher drunk than out there on the street. Like, yep. please right. keep coming back. And it is. It's it's unreal. that that It's like that fight scenes in the movies or something where somebody should just lay down almost, you know, and, but they just keep getting up and it's, mm -hmm. it's ugly and it's hurt. It hurts, hurts me. I end up, you know, I have to be careful because I will, uh, I'll take some of that on mm -hmm. watching people do that. And I'm fortunate that I haven't had somebody that I loved like that in my life doing it. I can't imagine, uh, trying to go through that struggle of having, you know, your, your soulmate, uh, struggling like that. Yeah, it was, um, it was awful. Did he get um, sober? Do what? Did he get sober? He's, he calls himself sober right now. Um, I believe that he's shooting steroids, which is neither here nor there. Um, it's to thine own self be true. Yep. But I, I would not call that sober. But yes, he's, we don't speak though. Um, he, I allowed him to make his amends because that's part of his program after uh -huh. he got sober. Um, but part of, Part, and I have to work my steps. I'm having to drop a fifth step today over it again because I don't understand, like, my codependency. Like, look at all this shit I did for you. Like, mm. 
you're sober now and I don't reap any of those benefits? Like, what the fuck? Like, mm. um, and, a, and a part of me does still love him, you know, and that's why I avoid him. Um, and he does Indiana recovery and I do Louisville recovery. And the, we just, I don't. We don't have any... Um, it was real toxic and really not a good situation. And I don't think we could ever get past um, some of the things that happened in that situation. So that ended. Um, the other thing that happened around that time was my sponsor of that entire time dropped me out of nowhere. Um, and that was like the most crushing blow ever. Like worse than him because she was like my person. Mm-hmm. She was my person for like the last four years of my recovery and out of nowhere she dropped me um and that utterly crushed my spirit and there was a time in there when I went to bed early because I wanted to drink like I wanted to drink and I was like well I can get in the car I can drive to the liquor store or I can just go to bed right now at 8 p.m and see if tomorrow's different so I just went to bed that's one of the uh shared on here before uh from my childhood sleep was one of my like a drug of choice kind of thing mm-hmm. of checking the fuck out by mm-hmm. sleep, whatever yep. that meant. And, you know, there was time whenever that was uh, from when I found out that you could maybe grab up some of the Benadryl out of the or some of the medicine out of the cabinet that would mm-hmm. help you the mom's PMs and and crash. Uh, yep. I can really relate with that of that. And I just don't want to be awake. It's the same thing. I mean, it's basically mm-hmm. the same thing as taking a drug. Oh, yeah. It's a coping skill for sure. Um, and I still find myself doing to do that now when I'm stressed. Oh, I, I want do. To go I to think sleep. everything looks better after a nap. I think that's perfectly acceptable coping skill. I, I didn't show you when we walked through the house. I got trophies for napping. Do you really? <laughs> I awesome. say that, but <laughs> I am a professional napper. There's rarely a day goes by I don't take a little nap. Nice. Yeah, I agree. Gotten really I don't good get at to it. do it that often anymore, but I, I support napping to the fullest. Um, so what it's looked like for the last two and a half years is it's been me. Um, which is huge for a codependent. So I, I like to, to joke that my codependency is in remission right now too, which it probably isn't. I just can be alone. But once a human being comes back into the picture, I'm sure it'll rear its ugly head. Mm. But, um, but that's been a gift. And I understand why people tell you to take that time to be alone and work on you when you first get sober. And I never did that. And so I've gotten to do that in the last two years. And today I know who Tamara is and what she likes and what she doesn't like. Um, and to really work on that un- unhealthy attachment style. Um, and a lot of that childhood trauma that I was just covering up with other human beings because they can be a drug too. They mm-hmm. change the way that I feel about yep. myself. Absolutely. Um, so two years ago, I decided to go back to school again. Um Right now, I work full-time in recovery, as well as um, I'm in a full-time Master's of Social Work program. Um, I will be graduating in May of 2020 with my Master's in Social Work. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And my ultimate goal is to be um, a therapist or a counselor. Right now, I do specialize in the drug addiction field, but I think at some point I would like to move past that Um maybe into gerontology. They're actually the largest growing section of um, addicts in the country right now is like the baby boomers as they hit over 50 Mm -hmm. because they're all on prescription pills. Yeah. Um, So two years ago in 2017, um, I jumped through the hoops and I paid the money and I got my Las Vegas felonies expunged. Um, And up until last month, I was a two-time felon then. Um, last month I got the third felony expunged here in Kentucky and I'm waiting to hear about the fourth one right now, but I anticipate that happening in the next couple weeks and that will be the first time since I was 18 that I will be a non-felon. That is awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are, I, I talk them here, this, when we say this, uh, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now, I always want to make sure that we come in and talk about like these miracles that have happened. And I just straight, straight up call, call them that. Some people call them promises. Some people call them other things. I call my miracles oh, of yeah. things that happened as a result of me, that I, of, of me walking, walking this path. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I hope to have mine off of me. And I really don't know the details of it. Uh, I'm still, a little bit down the road and probably you know i don't know i have not looked into it i try to do this thing a day at a time at some level and uh one thing uh 
you know, I, I was a big firearm enthusiast, and and I don't get to do that today. Mm -hmm. I hunt and fish. I can't take my kids gun hunting. Right. I can't go out and we can't go duck hunting or rabbit hunting or or do things like that today. And I, and I but I fully expect, just like you said, and you know, you are really have a lot more uh, concrete vision that this is going to go that this last one is that you said was the last one right mm -hmm. the last one is going to be going away because it's in process right yes uh, it just needs the the da already <clears throat> um said that there's no legal grounds to oppose it so it just goes to the judge to be signed right yeah i have the same kind of confidence that on that mine will be gone down the road too when the time is right uh i have absolutely i have absolutely no idea what any of that means i've just kept on walking my walk for the past coming up on five years and uh at some point i'll look at that but congratulations for that and i'm glad that they do that you know didn't kentucky just change to their voting so yeah so they did now um disenfranchised people have the right to vote um i think they'll probably do it the same way that indiana does it as long as you're not currently incarcerated or a ward of the state you can vote which is huge right yeah yeah um and that's definitely been an amazing process um i've gotten to do some really cool things like go to children's advocacy day at the capitol and be part of that um, I get to go back in prison right now as part of a research team. We're actually conducting research on the elderly and aging population in the state of Kentucky for the Department of Corrections and kind of see what that looks like. The people aging and um, the incarcerated aging. Mm-hmm. Yep, because they have their own special needs. Mm -hmm. um, and the system is not currently set up to take care of that at all. Um my life today is just it's amazing and uh and I, it's cliche because they're like well if you had uh, asked me what i wanted when i first got sober i don't have any of that i don't i don't have the person i don't have a family i don't have any of that but i have my two cats and like my life is amazing i have human connection and i do believe that human connection um is the end antithesis of addiction 100 percent. you yeah. just need one solid support person that's got your back and you can change the entire world yeah i agree with that 100 percent uh that that the the you say cliche is the one if i'd have written a script mm -hmm. i'd have sold myself way short mm -hmm. had i had i done that and, uh, and i and, and that is a uh, another bell ringer of, of people that sit at this table that talk about uh yeah, I had no, I had no idea that I'd get to do the kind of things that I'm getting to do today, mm -hmm. and I probably wouldn't have picked them. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, the uh, it's interesting you talk about that aging thing, and I trying to decide in the incarcerated population. Uh, my mom, I got my pills for my mom was my first starting point. She'd had surgeries in all her life, and mm -hmm. starting out from whenever a cancer diagnosis when I was ten years old. I live in this house. I, I grew up in this house. And then I got married and had the person and the two cars and the two kids and a dog and a half and all that. It looked like I had my life together, mm -hmm. but really I was crumbling internally, right. uh, doing everything I could do to keep things together. And uh, when she left me, uh, you know, it, it was my house, mm -hmm. right? Because we actually bought it from my parents down the road when they were wanting to downsize and it came available. And so I still live in the house that I, that I uh, grew up in. But, uh, and I still remember where I was standing. I can still take you to where I was at when my mom told her family members that she had cancer. And I wasn't, I was told to go outside and play, but I don't listen. Mm -hmm. And I knew some news was coming out that I needed to be aware of. Right. But kind of like you were saying, you know, now that I got this news, I got, I, I, I stole this news. Mm -hmm. So now I can't tell anybody or get any clarification on what cancer means. Right. And I'm just a little kid. And, uh, so, but mom ended up having a string of that and was a professional lady, you know, was, a was a but was, uh, dependent upon pain medication her entire life. And, and to me, once I got sober, it looked like addiction. I can't, you know, we don't really, we don't try not to slap them labels on other people, but it sure looked like that. And, uh, where I was going with that was that, uh, I have somebody who's in my life right now that's in prison that's old mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and they really have a lot of health issues and yeah. you're right. There's no nothing is set up for this person to survive that actually no that's really what it almost that's what it looks like to me it's like you know this is a, he, he did not receive a death sentence no but it is a but death it sentence. is mm -hmm. at his age because it's highly unlikely he's going to make the time that he made 
under the hell they you know he's already keeps getting taken to the hospital because they yeah. find him out in his cell mm-hmm. he's unresponsive in his cell and one of those will probably be the end mm-hmm. uh, sooner or later so it's interesting that you say that because i hadn't really like you know hadn't processed that that that, that, that that's a thing you know what yeah, i mean it's kind of like a law mode like i couldn't process it anything else in my life is a thing until somebody else shows it to me right mm-hmm. I can't uh so that's that's really neat that that's the direction you're wanting to go into uh because it sounds like i have some soft spot for this underserved oh absolutely uh and you know that certainly wasn't me ever right. again I'd, i've never had that kind of empathy and thoughts for somebody else that's uh that's uh falls in that category so it's always me 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 right um I kind of got stumped there because it hit me. I probably will just share that offline afterwards. Um, someday it'll be on here. So uh, your full-time chemical dependency counseling now? Yes. Um, currently, right now, um, I work with the Department of Corrections, Substance Abuse Ladies. Um, so it's funny how that's come full circle. Uh-huh. Um, I do a morning and a nighttime group with them, and they have to meet with me for 56 sessions in order to complete. Um, and I love it. Like, um, the DOC and the Department of Corrections and the incarcerated people, that's my population. Like, I love it, and I understand. Um, and I don't self-disclose. Um, I think they know that I'm in recovery due to my lingo, because we have a language. Mm-hmm. Um but I don't self-disclose any of my past history or, you know, like that I was where you were. I think it's really important not to put the emphasis on me and more empower them as to what they can do with it. Um, it's an interesting angle, you know, because that's like the other way around from the time when you did your fifth step. It was mm-hmm. important that that person let her darkness yeah. out and show it to you. But in this situation, you don't do that. No, in a therapeutic setting, um, self-disclosure, only when it's beneficial to the client. And generally, it's not. There's Hmm. a really fine line there. Uh, Another new thing. My sponsor is a counselor in Louisville in a a facility, in a detox and rehab facility. Um, And and I learn a lot from him, but I know certain things at different angles. And in a corrections field, it's probably another set of things, right, that then that uh, then what might be different in a detox center or, uh, no, cause even, no, cause even at work, I don't self disclose. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm from the belief that you can get your help anywhere. So, um, when the clients ask me like, are you one of us? Are you in recovery? I challenge them and I'm like, why does that matter? Does it make me any less credible to help you as a human being Hmm. with your problem? You know, um, because it's a disadvantage for people that are not in recovery in the field. Because basically it makes me an expert. Well, they don't know anything and nobody wants help from them. And that's not fair. Um, That's an interesting thought, you know, because I would have said, and I just actually had a conversation with somebody not long ago about a time when I was in one of my detoxes uh most and again you know just basically putting the tail feathers out just let me go jump through this hoop and y'all leave me alone I, okay i'll go again mm-hmm. and uh and and i had some experiences with people who were not in the program and i would tell you today that those didn't impact me i put a wall up because that person didn't know you know it wasn't one of me but when i ended up getting in connection with somebody who was that was a turning point of like the connection to go hmm uh, this guy really does know what's up, and I guess it's all just different perce- perceptions, you know. I mean, and I, the thing about this the world is that black and white usually aren't the colors. No, they're somewhere in between. In many ways, work in many ways. Uh, everybody needs their uh, package wrapped with a different color bow. Mm-hmm. So. Is there anything else you want to talk about today? I'd be interested in hearing any other miracles or anything else. Or then uh, also what I also do is like have what I call a concluder. So if uh, most time what I hear is I see like an audible sigh behind somebody when they're like done. Mm-hmm. I'll hear them. They'll kind of go. <sighs> uh, I hadn't caught that yet, but I might have missed it. Um, so is there 
any place else you want to go in here or in, in the concluding thoughts on um i just think that it's very important um to advocate um not only as a person in long-term recovery but just to advocate in general for um, disenfranchised people and people that don't have a voice due to current circumstances. Um, so, so be the change, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world. Um, and it, it will never harm you to help somebody else out. So just um, do the best you can with what you have and, and be the change that you want to see in the world. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I always make gifts for my friends and my family. Most uh, that's just what I do out here. And my uh, gift to my sponsor this year is a little like shadow box affair. And I made this little token, and on it I wrote, I carved, "Be the change." Aww. Uh interesting that that's uh, the terms you used in uh, in the concluder here because I see him doing that, and that's what I think of when I see him is uh, somebody demonstrating that change rather than uh he's being it rather than trying to manage it or try to make it happen oh there is something else that i do want to say though and i think it's very important um coming from a straight 12-step background um you know mental health even though in the book it says um it is okay you know we're not doctors we don't have opinions on outside issues it is perfectly okay to seek outside help that was never really encouraged for me ever Mm. um and that might just be my experience but it was kind of uh frowned upon you know if you're on any kind of mental health meds when i got sober um so last year a year ago when i turned um eight eight years sober i was ready to kill myself i hit a very deep depression um i don't really know what brought it on it could have been all the stress from grad school it could have been the holidays it could have been anything um and there was a two-week period when i wanted to die twice um and you know it, it popped into my head that this is not what it should be to be sober and I went to my doctor and I told them and they gave me the little depression questionnaire and I scored a perfect score um and so last year a year ago um I started an antidepressant which has completely changed my entire life um and I also started individual therapy which has been a huge turning point and an amazing gift to myself Um, because AA and 12 step communities are fantastic. And for me, it has worked 100% with the substances, but I have other issues. Um, and I'm a human being and some of those issues need to be treated, um, with outside help and therapy and mental health medications. So I'm a strong proponent of seeking outside help. Please, please do it because most people are dual diagnosis by the time they reach the rooms. I agree 100%. I do beat that little drum. I love pull it out because I do the same thing. And it says straight up, do not disregard human health measures. Mm-hmm. But God is abundantly supplied the world with fine doctors, psychologists, and practitioners of various kinds. Mm-hmm. That's one of my favorite things, the practitioners of various kinds. Because mm-hmm. that's a wide open door Yeah. Uh, to, doing, to doing that. And, uh, so, yeah, you're right. And anybody who says different is, uh, is hurting people because life is not a static thing, you know. It's not that we like hit to just, you know, it really is that journey thing. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you had this all along. Maybe this was part of the deal and it just now come to the surface where you're able to deal with it. Or maybe life changes in our chemistry and different things happen or whatever. And all of a sudden we need something uh, that we didn't need before. You know, and one of my posts, you know, because we will have people sit around and say you ain't sober if you're taking psych meds. And it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, you know. I had to, I took some antidepressants through a divorce, mm-hmm. you know, because I just couldn't stop fucking crying. Right. I mean, I couldn't function. Mm-hmm. You know, I sitting at work, I turn around, I'm gonna cry. Yeah. And and I had to have something to to rest that for a little while. Mm-hmm. And it well, that was just a you know, and and that was a temporary measure. But I needed something to get a handle on. So I'm glad you brought that up because uh, with your with, it's kind of funny because uh, it's not funny. What I mean is is that. You have the 12 step background and you also have the education to back up mm-hmm. what you know, you know, and that's, that's, 
that says a ton, you know. So we're not just because over here on this side of the table, it's just some Indiana New Omni hillbilly uh, to some extent that really doesn't have any grounds really stand on other than my 12 step one more I've been taught here. Uh, I, have, I don't even have it. I, I get to check the some college box. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I appreciate that you say that here on that and I, and I put the grounding in it. Uh, any other concluding thoughts? Just uh, everybody's recovery looks different. So whatever works for you, do that. Don't compare your recovery to other people's recovery. Yeah. You know, that your own conception mm -hmm. can be a big, can, can be a big lasso. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever that is. Conception of recovery, recession of, yeah. So thank you for that. I enjoyed your story. I certainly know that now that I haven't heard it before. You, know, you kind of sit around and you watch, you know, you go to speaker meetings and you hear people and kind of lose track of who you heard and who you haven't and that kind of thing. And I thought that I had, but now that I'm almost certain that I have not because of the details that you shared today. Uh, that is amazing. Uh, that's the fact that people go through and experience the kind of things that you shared and still, you know, because a lot of people would think, like you said, you'd already been checked off as a lost cause at certain points mm -hmm. in your life. That this was, you know, that these were things. And obviously all those people were wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's another lesson I'm hearing here today is, you know, that, that deal by never giving up on this thing. You talked about uh, some other people who you, you just keep coming back and fake it till you make it and just mm -hmm. keep trudging and keep standing back up, you know. And I don't care what you're doing in life. It's getting sober is one of those things. If it's going back to school. If it's trying to figure out how to get into your kids, back into your kids' lives, if it's trying to figure out where your occupation lies, whatever that is, if you just keep on getting back up, it's things we tend to find our path. Yep. Uh, that, that getting knocked down and quitting and becoming the victim or the martyr and assuming those positions is uh, where you'll run into the dead end. And, and thank God I've got a bunch of friends around me, that support system that uh, keeps an eye on me too. And I don't have to uh, do this thing alone. I've got people watching me, yep. and they'll let they will hold me accountable, and they let me know when I'm looking like I'm going over to the wrong side of the rails once in a while because I'm still just as liable to do that today as I ever was mm -hmm. uh, to start to wander or start getting to being a jackass or you know uh, get a little uppity because I get to do the podcast or mm -hmm. you know do different things and people can rein me back in and pull me back to the center. Um, Thanks for coming in today. You can have that if you want it. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of sitting out there somewhat like for that reason. Uh, crystals is something else that I open my eyes to that I would have never done anything with. And I'm a believer in them. I put them here to generate energy. They're pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I like that too. And uh, and I'd have never, I'd have poo-pooed that. I'd have poo-pooed uh, essential oils. I'd have poo-pooed uh, eating healthy. I'd have poo-pooed yoga. Oh, yeah. I'd have. Uh, so many of those things now that are part of my life that are regular things in my life today uh, are a result of uh, of walking this path, and uh, you know I'd have, I'd have never I'd have never guessed I'd be doing the things I'm doing today. Uh, miracles happen when you when you get sober, you work this program, and you get some principles in your lives that uh, that that can that can just change the whole trajectory of your of your life. And thank you for sharing yours here today. Uh, SpiritualUnderground.org that's the uh, website supports the podcast, dtmww.net. You're starting to hear some commercials. We got some uh, sponsors on the uh, podcast now, so you'll hear a little of that in the middle. And twelve step spiritual recovery, James Christopher Cohn. Hey, if you're not having a blast in your recovery, it's your own damn fault. And thank you all for allowing me to participate in my recovery in this manner today. Peace out.
only did the things they would approve of Lock away all your dreams inside your head Year after year you try to be a good girl They never failed to point out when you were bad Stuck to the program like a robot Trophy for mom and dad Inside you are It's time to put away 